there's something important happening here. For the first time, here's technology that seems more human scale, that seems more organic, it seems lifelike in some weird way. My guest today, Kevin Kelly, is the co-founder of Wired Magazine, a best-selling author, and a futurist. He had the good fortune to stumble onto the internet when it was just getting started, and he had the foresight to understand it was going to change everything. So I have a friend named John List, and he's a prominent economist who has the misfortune of sharing his name with a mass murderer. So when you Google him, the first John List you see is not him. Instead, you see the mass murderer. I had the opposite experience with you. I went first to Amazon.com because I knew you'd written some books, and I typed in Kevin Kelly books. And a bunch of books on technology showed up, which I figured were probably you from everything I know about you. Then there are all sorts of other books about photography of Asia and a graphic novel and a book of advice. And I thought, God, this is so frustrating when someone's got such a common name that there are <laughs> a bunch of Kevin Kellys who are all authors. I slowly and disbelievingly came to realize that the same Kevin Kelly, you, had written <laughs> all of these different books. And I have to say, damn, you have really lived a full life. I have. I've been very, very blessed. One could say that I'm very good at doing lots of little things, and I have sort of refused to go too far deep in one direction. So that's sort of the curse of a, of a journalist. You know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Your biography seems to me refreshingly free of a master plan. I'm curious, can you remember what life you thought you were going to lead when you were 18 or 19 and just getting started? The earliest memory that I have was, I don't know, maybe I was 12 years old, and I had this idea that what I wanted to do in my life was to build my own house that was completely self-sufficient and self-recycling and nothing was ever thrown out. There was something elegant about the logic of that, and I was a maker as a kid. I made stuff all the time, and I thought that would be the ultimate thing. And then when the Whole Earth Catalog came along, when I saw that in a senior year of high school, that was my answer. I have to profess ignorance. I've heard of the whole earth data. Like, I don't even really know what it is, though. Steve Jobs called it the internet before the internet. It was all the information that you kind of get from the internet and blogs and YouTube um, on newsprint. There was, before that time, no other way to find out how to do things in life. Say you wanted to become an advertising agent. Say you wanted to build your own home. Say you wanted to fix your own car. Where would you go to figure out how to do that? You couldn't go to the <laughs> library. They didn't have that kind of information. If you wanted to buy some ball bearings or something, how would you find out where they were? And so the Whole Earth Catalog was kind of like the first attempt to round up all this kind of enthusiast knowledge and say, here's what you want to know if you want to start your own school. Here's what you need to know if you want to learn these new things that we call computers. The Horth catalog disappeared as soon as the web came because it was the web on newspaper. Now, college was never part of your plan, is that true? No, it was actually always part of the plan when I was in high school. That was what everybody was sort of aiming towards. I was both an avid science nerd, doubling up in math and science and taking every single possible course I could and art. And then in high school, I discovered photography, which was just, for me, a nice combination of the technical and the artistic. But when senior year came around, I just needed to do something other than sit in a desk for four more years. <laughs> I needed an internship. I needed a gap year. I needed some kind of graduate level project, but there wasn't any like that. And Believe it or not, you know, I applied to, I think, six colleges that I saw in a book. I wound up going to the University of Rhode Island without having visited any campuses. And I was very disappointed because it was literally a little tiny state school in the middle of potato fields. It was just the wrong place to be. And I just said, I can't be in grade 13. I need to do something. So I dropped out. What was your something? My something was photography. So I did a workshop in photography because I was only self-taught. And photography of those days meant that you had to do the chemistry. You know, you're doing mm -hmm. the chemical developing and the optical stuff. And it was very, very technical. And then I decided to read books for a year. And I was reading books every day, all day. And I happened to read Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. 
and, and it just blew my gasket. It just, I had to travel at that moment. <laughs> he completely infected me with his contagious enthusiasm. And it's like, I have to see this because I've never been out in New England. I've never been anywhere. We didn't take vacations. <laughs> um, I had a friend who was studying Chinese in Taiwan. And my dad had a friend who lived in Japan. And so I said, I'm going to go and photograph in Taiwan, China. <laughs> and I called up, I called up National Geographic. I found the photo editor's name in the phone book. I'm 19 years old. And I say, I'm going to go to Taiwan and Japan. Do you need any photographs? <laughs> and bless his heart, Bruce McElfrish. He said, you know, it doesn't work that way. But when you come back, show me photographs, which he was true to his word. And I took a train to Washington and I started showing photographs to National Graphics. I was kind of resigning myself to never having any money, to having lots of time and maybe building a house that was completely <laughs> self-sufficient in the woods, <laughs> doing a little photography, maybe doing some science experiments, making things, which is what I love to do. All that has happened since then would have been beyond my belief. So eventually you, you worked your way into the middle of the technology boom, and, and you've been there ever since as a, a close yeah. observer of those trends. And I'm curious, what do you think the biggest technological inflection points have been in our lifetimes? The developments that have changed the way we live or the way we will live? What are the biggest ones? Computers themselves were actually quite boring. My dad actually worked with computers and took me to a computer show in, believe it or not, 1965. And I was so, so unimpressed. <laughs> I was bored out of my mind. And I basically said, these are not computers. I know what computers are. Computers are things that you talk to. <laughs> you have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I read science fiction. Mm -hmm. These are things that didn't even have screens. They had a big typewriter that would print out the answers, the results. You talk to it by having a stack of punch cards. It's like, I have no interest in this. It wasn't until we married the telephone to the computer that they became interesting to me and interesting to the world. When we put the modem onto a computer, that was the internet, they became a communications device. And communications is sort of the foundation of culture. And so now we were suddenly accelerating and amplifying the culture. And that was incredibly important. I had early access because I became a travel writer in some ways. And I decided to write about this very, very embryonic place, the online world of bulletin boards, as if it was another country. I experienced a little bit of things like bulletin boards, and I could not have been less impressed. I did not see <laughs> any future at all. For me, the first moment where I had any inkling that it possibly could be useful was when search became easy, which was a long time after what you're talking about, right? Right. For those several decades, there was the internet. Nobody was very impressed. You had to know a little bit of co command code to get anywhere. And it was sort of ignored, even though people like me were kind of saying, no, this is coming, this is coming. And it was ignored until this moment in around 92, 93, when we had a graphical user interface and the web. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, bang, everybody got it. You could do search, you could drag and drop stuff. And that's when everything took off and everybody started paying attention. That was when Wired began and we were at the center of that. And by the way, fast forwarding a little bit, I think this is exactly the same kind of excitement and energy that we're seeing right now with AI, which has been around for at least 10 years in its mm -hmm. capabilities. And then suddenly we have the conversational user interface. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. all of a sudden you can talk to it in a conversational dialogue way, which is very, very human-like. and it's now the big thing because everybody can understand it and interact with it and experience it. And they're going, oh my gosh, the capabilities of this have been around for a while, but now you have the conversational user interface, mm -hmm. which we're going to apply to everything, just like we applied screens, the graphical user interface to everything. So I would say that communications aspect, linking everybody up and of course the smartphone and carrying those things in our pockets, enabling billions of people to connect to each other. That only happens one time in the planet, and we are alive for that <laughs> moment. I have to say, on cell phones, too, I could not really see what the point of one was. In the beginning, it was just for calls, and I have turned into, I literally live only on my cell phone. I don't use a computer anymore, except mm. in extreme cases. And my cell phone is my most beloved belonging. I mean, the hardest thing about thinking about the future or trying to, to describe it is letting go of what we expected it to be 
and letting go of the current models. And the thing about the future that we can almost promise is that it's going to be unreasonable. <laughs> it's going to, it's <laughs> like, you know, what's going on today, if you tried to pass that off 20 years ago, nobody's going to believe you. Wired is 30 years old this year. At the 25-year anniversary, I went back and looked at all the early issues of Wired to see what we officially thought the future of, say, the internet was going to be. And in the very, very beginning, even Wired got it wrong because what we were kind of expecting was better television. Like, oh, there'll be 500 channels. Well, the idea that there would be like 5 million or 5 billion channels with like YouTube, <laughs> we had trouble believing that anybody could produce quality video in their bedroom. Now, these developments, the ones that have actually happened, like the web, mm -hmm. the YouTube, AI, they seem inevitable, mm. preordained. But mm -hmm. do you think that's true? Or do you think we could have found ourselves in a very different technological world if you know a few key people hadn't been born or some critical investment hadn't been made? Do you think there was a real shot at, at these technologies not being there? I wrote a book called The Inevitable, so I am obviously biased in that general direction. I think the larger forms of these technologies, the larger contours, which are dictated by physics and chemistry and just the nature of matter, you can do certain things, you can't do other things. I think the larger outlines of these technologies are inevitable. Once a planet Terry civilization discovers electricity and maybe make speakers, they're going to have telephones. So the telephones are going to be inevitable, but the iPhone is not necessarily inevitable. The actual specifics are inherently unpredictable. The internet was inevitable, but the character of the internet, like who owns it? Is it open source or closed source? Is it for profit or nonprofit? Is it transnational or is it nationalistic? And so those characters, we have a lot of choice about. And they make a huge difference to us. I would say that applies to biology, which is, by the way, a controversial statement. If you have evolution of life on a planet similar to the Earth, you're going to get quadruped animals because that is physically very stable. That's just a natural solution. So quadrupeds will be inevitable. The zebra is not. We'll be right back with more of my conversation with Kevin Kelly after this short break. You and everybody else seems to think that AI is going to be completely transformative. Can you try to put in really simple terms what you think AI is going to do that's going to be so awesome? It's like electricity a little bit in the sense that electricity enables so many other things to happen. And AI is this enabling technology. So dealing with an AI directly, yes, that's one form of it, but that's actually the least important form of it most of the AI that's coming will never be visible to you. It's going to be behind the back offices, buried deep into the underground. It's like infrastructural. It's going to be used to help us find new drugs. Or already it's happening for that. Mm -hmm. Here's a drug that works. Find me something similar. It's going to be used in medicine for diagnosing things. The AI doctor today is not as good as a human doctor, but a human plus an AI is better than either a human alone or an AI mm -hmm. alone. And that AI doctor, even though it's not as good as a human doctor, is a million times better than no doctor. Uh -huh. So in medicine, it's this very, very large enabling effect. And that goes across all the other industries where there's a kind of like a bumping up in the levels caused by AI independently of our own interactions with them. The way to think about it is not as a singular thing. It's, it's AIs, plural, will make hundreds, thousands of different varieties of them. And we're going to use them to work with our own minds. There are problems that our own kind of intelligence is probably incapable of solving alone. So solving quantum gravity, dark matter, probably is going to require inventing other kinds of minds that we can work with and that's, of course, is going to be incredibly impactful. So you describe AI in really glowing terms. Other people are terrified of AI. Right, right. The simplest thing to be afraid of is that you'll lose your job. I prefer to talk about the actual evidence of how these things are being used rather than their imaginary harms. And so I've been trying to track who actually, to this date here that we're recording, has actually lost their job due to AI. Medical transcribers 
you're a doctor, you're looking at an x-ray, and you dictate what you're seeing. And some human was transcribing that into text that could be shared. Mm -hmm. Well, the AI translators are just so good. I have not been able to find a single artist anywhere who's actually lost their job due to AI. You might lose your job description mm -hmm. doing different tasks, but you're unlikely to lose your job. And that's been the, the case so far in, in technology. And we find it really kind of hard to imagine what those jobs would be. If in the 1900s, if you told your great grandfathers that there would only be 1% of farmers, they would say, mm -hmm. well, what are we gonna do? Yeah, and you would exactly. say, oh, I'm gonna be a mortgage broker. Or you're gonna be a web designer. <laughs> you're gonna be um, you know, athletic yoga coach. And they would, they would have no clue what you're talking about. And so the number of new jobs that are gonna be created by AI will exceed whatever loss there are. If AI is as powerful as I am suggesting it is, that means it's going to introduce problems as powerful as it. The more powerful the technology, the more powerful the problems. So I'm not a utopian. I don't believe that we're headed into something where there's diminished numbers of problems. I'm an optimist because I think our capacity to solve problems is increasing even faster. One thing that confuses me when I try to imagine the path by which AI takes over everything. Right now, training an AI system requires lots of well-labeled data. So if you want an AI system yeah. to distinguish between cats and dogs, you need to show it images of known cats and images of known dogs. And once you do it, AI is shockingly good. Or maybe chess is even better example, right? All you have sure, to do is yeah. tell the AI system the rules of chess. And because it can play against itself and gets really strong feedback and it learns what moves work or not, I mean, within hours, these amazing systems are, are better than any humans have right. ever been. But what's not so obvious to me is how AI systems will get the training data and the extensive reliable feedback that they'll need in many of the real world settings that matter. One of the things I would love as an academic economist would be to have a, a an AI friend who would just feed me great ideas for academic economics papers. And I'm wondering, do you, do you think that it would be enough feedback for that AI to, to throw out a hundred ideas at a time? And I'd say, oh, I like that one. I don't like that one. I like this one. I don't like that one. Do you, do you think it would take almost an infinite path to get to, to it actually knowing what a great idea was, in my opinion? No, I, I think we're, we'll close in on that fairly, fairly soon. But let me say something about the, the the current state, which is, so you mentioned dogs and cats. So the way that these large language models work is they have to train on millions of examples, a million dogs and a million cats, and they know it. But a human toddler can learn to tell the difference between a cat and a dog with just 12 examples. Hmm. So we have an existence proof that you don't actually need to have these kind of large language training sets. And right now, that's important because the only people who can afford to have these billions of training sets are the big companies. You have o open AI being kind of disrupted, but they had a lot of money behind them. And so if you don't need that, if you can have these really small sets and, and have AI, you take away a lot of the issues of the curation and the ownership stuff. And it means that there's a lot more room for the small startups to have some impact. We're right now, we're making a lot of assumptions about AI based on the current version of them. And again, we want to kind of liberate our minds from the current thing. <laughs> and we know I'm not good at that. Yeah. We know that's the, right, I'm the right. worst at that. The shock that we've had this year is, is to see that these um, current models actually can produce what I call small case or minor creativity. They're trained on the average of human content creation. So what you're getting is the wisdom of the crowd average. And you have to kind of work with them to get them out of that average. We can maybe do better by training them on the best, only the best stuff, and that might help, but they will get better. They will be capable of becoming our partners, but they're still gonna be much more likely to produce something that a typical human would produce and would like, because that's what they're doing. They're, they're auto-completing. One of the best things I find these AI is useful for is synthesis, where they're able to, like, Take a spreadsheet here and spreadsheet here and merge them, or take this field of knowledge and this field of knowledge, and what would 
be a, a question or some way that the two come together or take this kind of painter and this painter and merge their styles. That is something humans could do, but it just takes us so much time mm -hmm. to do it that we can't do it in a kind of a frivolous way. And it seems like they're geniuses, but in fact, we're going to kind of look back at this time in 30 years from now and realize, oh, no, no, the, pro the problem was, was that we thought that creativity was some elevated divine level. <laughs> and it turned out to be fairly easy to make. Do you think there's any realistic way to regulate AI or to use public policy so it does maximum good? Yes, I do. I think it has to be regulated. But I think it's really misguided to try and regulate something we don't have any idea what it is. We don't even know what it could do or not do. We're just discovering that. And yet we're already trying to regulate it. I think it's closer to like medical information. It's a really bad thing to, to, to try to devise policy on like one or two medical studies. It probably takes around 100 studies to really get close to what's going on in something. One or two medical studies their data points themselves are just not sufficient to make policies. And we don't have that level of evidence yet in this stuff to, I think, to be confident that any regulation that we do would even work because it's just so new. And, and that's why I preach this idea of, of street use. We have to use things. We cannot figure out what they're going to be like by thinking about them. They become so complex that predicting their next thing is, is, is basically unpredictable. And so the only way we can regulate them is through the evidence of what they're actually doing. And I think that's going to take a time, maybe even a generation. One of the things I find interesting about you is, is the enthusiasm with which you embrace complexity. You don't shy away from problems that have complex dynamics and, and you find ways to be thoughtful and to make predictions. I presume this delight in complexity, it's, it's a conscious choice, right? Just interesting that you put it that way. I've never heard it that way, but I think you're correct. One of the most formative experiences I had was when I was at Whole Earth and I went to the first artificial life conference in 1987. And it was produced by the Santa Fe Institute, which was something nobody even heard of at that time. Mm -hmm. Later on, they started to label what they were doing was a study of complexity. It's a term that we use now for the kinds of things that in the past we've always admired, like life as a complex system. Maybe a better way to say it is I have an affinity for systems and whole systems thinking, mm -hmm. sometimes called cybernetics. And one of the things that that also often propels you to do is to take a longer view of things because the systems that I'm interested in are operating at a scale where they're very long term, they're very long engines. I find that taking a long now view helps understand what's really going on and helps direct where we're going. And it's in part the source of my optimism because the longer view you have, I think the more optimistic you can be. So I have to confess, I, I'm terrified of complexity. <laughs> I have I've spent my whole life trying to avoid it in my academic life, picking simple, easy yes, problems. Right, right, like, right, right. you know, is your real estate agent ripping you off? Are, are teachers cheating on behalf of the students? <laughs> These are simple problems I could answer. And, and I very self-consciously steered myself away from macroeconomics, which is the, the part of my profession, which does tackle complexity. But hearing you talk about complexity and thinking about how economics deals with macroeconomics, they're completely opposite. The, yeah. the macroeconomists, they also abhor complexity. They have straight-jacketed their study of the economy into these incredibly simplified models that are no longer at all realistic, but can be solved using right. the tools that we use to come up with very simple answers. And so I've actually been really frustrated with macroeconomics for a long time. And I think if there were some way to push economists towards your embrace of complexity, it, it could really do good in, in macroeconomics. Well, there is a whole contingent at the Santa Fe Institute of working with economists to, to try and do exactly that. But when you say a contingent, you mean like five out of, <laughs> of, of a thousand. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, so right. So I understand there are a few people on the edges you think of, it, but they're not easily accepted into the right. the discipline. They're they're very much on the fringes and, right, and right. working, you know, mostly publishing in other kinds of journals. You're absolutely correct. And often, um, even at their best, a lot of these approaches 
don't give really satisfying answers. They often will give you kind of vague trends and, um, you know, probabilities more than anything else, which policy people have no <laughs> have no use for because they, they, they want some things with answers. If you're going to be comfortable with complexity, you're probably going to have to be comfortable with uncertainty. That makes a lot of people very uncomfortable. The academic macroeconomists, they might disagree, but my characterization would be they're not really about explaining what happens in the macroeconomy anymore. Their focus has become, can we write down a set of internally consistent models and talk to each other about those models? And it seems like there's a spot in between what's happening at the Santa Fe Institute and what's happening in academic economics, which is saying, look, I don't exactly understand why different things yeah. are happening in the macro economy, but I'm going to just show you some patterns and I'm going to do more descriptive work and, and be content to then maybe try to do prediction, knowing that your predictions are coming from a model that, that isn't right, right. based in traditional ideas of causality. It's based in more complex new data methods that are black boxes, and it, it, it kind of abhor black boxes. So I, well, I would make a little, little prediction being complete outsider to this, which is I think AI will, will begin to transform this little corner of economics in the same way as you just suggested. It did with um, a language translation. The, the way that Google and these current models do language translation um, was they, they bypassed the whole idea of what's the theory of language. You know, the joke was that they made progress to the degree that they fired the linguists. Okay. <laughs> and all they did was to say, what's the pattern of, of a language and spelling? And we're going to give you the next word based on that brute force patterns. And so I can easily see that starting to head into the economics, particularly the macroeconomics, where they're applying AIs and say, we don't have a theory, but we can definitely tell you what's likely to happen next. And there's going to be people wringing hands and getting upset because we don't understand what the models are, but they seem to work. And going back then to what some of the problems of AI, is, to me, it's not unemployment, it's closer to this, that we're going to have things that are making decisions, that are doing things, and we don't understand how they work. I think it's going to be a, a tremendous learning process to do that. And, and the thing to keep in mind, of course, is that we're somewhat comfortable dealing with humans who have no idea how their <laughs> brains work either. I once did a consulting project with an airline, and we were trying to work on pricing. And I said, well, how do you set prices? And they said, we input a bunch of things into this model, and it tells us what the prices are. And I said, how does it work? And said, we have no idea. We <laughs> hired this guy from UCLA and he built this thing and he's not around anymore. So we just put him in and hope for the best. And we actually tried to do a pricing experiment and the prices didn't change. So in the end, they paid me this big consulting fee. And then we never changed a single price because nobody could figure out how to actually change prices. And I think that's a bit small of what you're talking about. Yeah. But what we're also doing these days is we're building another set of AIs, we call explainable AIs, to try and explain what the other AI is doing. The thing about that is that is the first step towards consciousness, where you have um, a reflective intelligence trying to communicate what the rest of the intelligence is doing. Most of the AIs that we're going to deal with won't be conscious because it's a total liability. You want them focused. You don't want them distracted thinking yeah. about whether they left the oven on or whether they <laughs> should have majored in finance. But we'll be able to do it uh, when it's necessary and useful. One of the projects you've worked on is creating a clock that's designed to keep mm -hmm. accurate time for the next 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the motivation for building that clock? So first of all, it's huge. Um, there are multiple versions of it. One version of it is in the London Science Museum, but there's a very large version that's almost complete inside a mountain in West Texas. It's nearly 500 feet tall inside this mm. mountain. And it's a clock that does not run electricity, yet it actually is a calculator, and it's calculating the time and ringing a set of chimes every day at noon that will ring a different melody for 10,000 years. And so the clock is ticking, so to speak, without human attention or input by itself. But the clock doesn't display the time unless humans go and visit it and t turn the turnstile and bring up the clock to the current time to display. 
So there's some need for humans to visit it. The purpose of the clock is primarily to have people say, what's the purpose of the clock? And, and, <laughs> and, and, be, and begin to think about long-term time. It's like, if you had a clock that could tick for 10,000 years, what could you do in 10,000 years? What would it see? Again, 10,000 years is a long... It's a very, very long time. I, mean, I think you accomplished your goal with me because I said, well, if you go back 10,000 years, there is agriculture. I don't think there are any cities. I don't think there's any written language. We're barely getting going. Right. So I, I, it's hard to imagine that far forward. Right. And, and that's why it was picked. 10,000 was kind of roughly the beginning of our civilization. I mean, it is impossible to imagine what we would be like in 10,000 years from now. But the point is that by thinking about time and that scale, you have permission to think about in terms of generations. Like, well, what if we just thought about 100 years into the future? What if we started something that might not be done in our own generation and it would benefit people just as we have benefited from the past couple hundred years of people making roads or buildings that we enjoy and use today? If you have a longer horizon, it permits you to overcome even fairly large disturbances. I mean, the beauty of compounding interest and compounding growth is that a small amount steadily compounded can overwhelm, so to speak, over the long term, even fairly major setbacks and disruptions. That's sort of the stock market idea. And, and um, it's basically been true. So our idea of, of the clock is to use it as like a little bit of like an icon, a mythic icon, like the picture of the whole earth. When people saw the picture of the whole earth in this early 70s for the first time, there was a sense of, oh, there's a little system that we have to kind of take care of. And it's sitting in this vastness of space. It's very fragile and very precious. We wanted something similar where there would be a way in which this time machine would help us think about time differently. One of the things that I found so interesting was how you think about if you want a clock to last for 10,000 years, what are the design elements to it? And it goes beyond just materials. You got to make sure that people don't want to vandalize it. Exactly. We did a lot of studies. I did, I did a whole study of time capsules in, in, in preparation for this. Mm -hmm. What a revelation that was. Almost 95% of time capsules are lost track of within five years of being buried. There was a time capsule I went to visit the San Francisco airport that had been buried in the 50s, I think, or 60s, it was completely lost track of. They uncovered it in construction, like in the mid 70s, and then they lost track of it again. <laughs> and, then, and then they discovered it close to when it was supposed to have been open in 2000. And it was just so disappointing because the things that people include they thought were so, so important. We're just kind of like no interest whatsoever in them. <laughs> and the things that we really want to know, they would never thought about putting in. So the time capsules, the best time capsules is actually our garbage dumps because it's saving everything. <laughs> and that's what you kind of want is, is all the things that we don't think are that important. So thinking about long-term clocks, there is a sense in which how do you not lose track of it? How do you prevent vandalism? How do you keep working the entire time? Because it needs some maintenance. What does that look like? And the most important thing is, you know, how does it remain relevant? We did a study of long-term digital storage, and it turns out it's, it's horrendous. All those floppy disks are unreadable, right? Only way to really maintain information over time is to exercise it. I call it not storage, but movage. It has to be constantly moving. And... Um, and it has to be cared for. This clock is being built by a nonprofit. It's called the Long Now Foundation that you co-chair. And the premise of the Long Now Foundation is that society isn't thinking long-term enough. And, and I, I can see strong moral arguments for being good ancestors, right? Especially when it comes to irreversible things, mm -hmm. extinctions, the climate cycle being knocked so far to whack that, that the earth becomes unlivable. But more generally, and especially for somebody like you who's an optimist, isn't it also likely that future generations will know much more than we yes. do? They'll be far richer than we are. And isn't there also a pretty strong case for just looking out for our own interests and knowing that because of progress, 
the next generations are going to do fine and we don't really need to worry about them. Yeah, I think we are really careful not to make, you know, hundred year plans or thousand year plans or to plans for the next generation. What we're trying to do is to increase the possibilities for the next generation. We don't want to close down those choices for them. We want to open them up and let them decide. And in fact, we are counting on them figuring out things that we can't figure out. So even the clock, by the way, is left unfinished. There are aspects of it that will be completed by future generations. So it's not deciding their fate as much as this equipping them to make great decisions themselves. I think that distinction is very, very important. And we often, in addition to talking about responsibility, we talk about long-term imagination. That's the thing that's the hardest to do is to try and imagine new choices and possibilities that we don't have right now. Imagine ways in which we can do things better. Part of my critique about the AI folks who are concerned about the end of the world is that they overestimate the value of intelligence. There's a lot of intelligence guys who think intelligence trumps everything. But most of the th great things in the world are happening not by the smartest people in the room. They're happening with people who have enthusiasm, who have imagination. Smartness and intelligence is one component. But if you put a man and a lion in a cage, it's not the smartest one that's going to win. <laughs> it's only one part of what we need to make things happen in the world. And the key thing of that is, is, is imagination, imagining mm -hmm. what could be, what we'd want, an alternative way of doing things. And that's not just IQ. You are listening to People I Mostly Admire with Steve Levitt and his conversation with Kevin Kelly. After this short break, they'll return to talk about Kevin's new book. I've been making the case that you're obsessed with complexity. And then you write your latest book, which is the exact opposite. It is a wholehearted embrace of simplicity. It's a collection of snippets, small bits of wisdom that you've learned along the way that you wish you had known when you were younger. Were you surprised to find yourself contemplating publishing a book of this form? Yes, it was completely an inadvertent type book. Um, I've been, I've been a fan of proverbs and pithy life guiding advice since Catholic school, where even though I didn't believe in God, I believed in the gospels. The sayings of Jesus were just like, man, that's, that's powerful stuff. So I was, I was always collecting quotes and I'd love the telegraphic potency that they have, the way of, that they can kind of expand in your own mind, the way that they can press a lot of knowledge. And, and the best ones would often have a little twist in them. I have to say, I was skeptical of your book. It's called Excellent Advice for Living. When I started this podcast, I had thought that if I could get these amazing guests on the show, one of the most valuable things I could do would be to get them to give up pearls of wisdom. And frankly, the advice I gave wasn't very good, at least in my opinion. So I just stopped asking. But I honestly, I really liked, I really liked your book because it surprised me. Mm. It's not just the, that the advice itself resonated with me. It's that the advice, it has a personality. And I felt like I was getting a fascinating window into your life and personality. That, I, I take that as a compliment. Thank you. One of the little bits of wisdom is um, art is in what you leave out. And a lot of my time with the book was trying to remove as many words as possible to distill this to its essence by leaving as much as I could out. I had Rick Rubin on the show recently, and that's his philosophy, yeah. 100%. Well, that's an editor. I'm a born editor. I'm not a born writer. And so the, the editing part of this is really where I, uh, I shine. The other part was I, I'm in some ways channeling the ancients. I mean, a lot of, a lot, not all, but a lot of the wisdom is, has been circulating for thousands of years through the Stoics and the Confucius and the Bible. But I was trying to put it into my own words, mm -hmm. make it more vernacular, and if all possible, as you said, to make it unpredictable. Part of the thing with AI these days, one of the things I say is like a really worthy goal is to arrange your life or become something where you're not predictable by AI. Again, AI is a prediction thing. It's going to try mm -hmm. and guess what 
the next average human would say, and you don't want to be the average human, if at all possible. You want to be you. Mm. And that's sort of what I'm trying to do with, with, with this, is to say it in a way that's never been said before. And that's hard with, with things that have been said before. Daniel Pink, the mm -hmm. psychologist, he blurbed your book. He said something like, if you don't find at least 17 golden nuggets of advice in the book, you're not awake. And <laughs> and I like that. So I did find at least 17. Can, can I read a few oh, that yeah, I like and get I your like, reaction? I like oh, to yeah. hear what, your, what some of your favorites are. One of my favorites, and, and precisely because I believe it 100% now, but I didn't realize it when I was young. And it resonates with something we've talked about earlier in this conversation already. So the, the proverb you, I don't know, do you call them proverbs? I don't know what the proverbs, right Proverbs, adages, call lessons, maxims. Okay, okay. So the adage, the adage that you create is, it says, being enthusiastic mm. is worth 25 IQ points. Yeah. I love that. I mean, it's, 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 it's absolutely true. This mostly came from our hiring spells at, at places like Wired, looking at the people that we were hiring. And that trait of enthusiasm, of commitment, of being all in, of being positive, of being encouraging, was one of the essential things that we were hiring because we were hiring people to make the web and there was nobody who had <laughs> web making skills. And so and so we're hiring, what I, the phrase I'd use was hire for attitude, train for skills. Mm -hmm. So another one I liked, because I know it's true, but I still struggle to live up to it, is... No is an acceptable answer, <laughs> even without a reason. Yes. I'm not sure I've ever said no to anybody without a reason. And, and actually, I'm, I'm taking your adage wow. as my permission to start doing that. I learned that um, from Stuart Brand, actually, my mentor at Whole Earth, who everybody would tell you was one of the most expert knowers. I mean, he would say no so politely so forcefully, his no, that didn't have excuses, but his no would always come couch in a way that was good for you that he was saying no, <laughs> all right? That was the genius. And that's how I, how I like to couch it. It's like, and, and I would say something like, I'm saying no because I can't give the kind of attention that your project deserves. Okay, maybe the most profound one for me, we tend to overestimate mm. what we can do in a day and underestimate what we can achieve in a decade. Can you talk about that one? It relates a little bit to long-term views and, and optimism, which is um, bad things happen fast and good things happen slow. And bad things happen fast because bad things are more probable. Good things, great things are improbable, take a lot more work. Slow progress is still progress. And so as you raise your time horizon, you are able to accomplish bigger and better and gooder things. Um, and it's more likely that you can overcome the inevitable hurdles and setbacks that are going to be present along the way. Well, what's interesting for me is that I, I could not be more aware of the fact that I write down what I want to do in a day and I never do everything that I think <laughs> I can do. And without thinking about it, I've always applied that same logic and assumed that it was true over a year yeah. or, a, or a decade but your proverb slowed me down. And I said, wait a second, let me think about 10 years ago. And I thought, wow, yeah, wow, how great some of the changes have been. And then I thought about a different 10 year span. And it's interesting that it took a little little proverb at, near the end of your book to open up an insight, which in, is obvious once you think to look at it. But I don't think in my entire life I've thought to look at it that way. I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. I'm glad that you got that out of the book. A lot of the messages center around the importance of kindness. Yes. Of doing things for other people. Have you always emphasized kindness in your life? Or is that something you only learned along the way? I think I got that from the Gospels. I, got, I think I got that from Jesus. It was a very prominent um, injunction that I believed even as a kid. And as I said, even when I didn't believe in God, I believed in that. I believed it because I was told it, but now I believe it because I have complete 100% experience. Like hatred is something that is a cancerous upon yourself and you wanna let go of it because it's really gonna affect you more than anybody else that you're aiming at. Mm -hmm. I have real world experience, life experiences in ways in which kindness is 
not a weakness. Kindness is a strength. And so that sense of trusting strangers, sure, every once in a while you're cheated, but that's a small tax compared to the overwhelming abundance of good stuff and goodwill that you'll get from people that you trust. So whereas I had it kind of on faith, literally on faith, mm -hmm. now I have it out of experience. And I think it's even wider than it was before. People I Mostly Admire is part of the Freakonomics Radio Network, which also includes Freakonomics Radio, No Stupid Questions, and The Economics of Everyday Things. All our shows are produced by Stitcher and Renbud Radio. This episode was produced by Morgan Levy and mixed by Jasmine Klinger. Lyric Bowditch is our production associate. Our executive team is Neil Carruth, Gabriel Roth, and Stephen Dubner. Our theme music was composed by Luis Guerra. We can be reached at pima at freakonomics.com. That's P-I-M-A at freakonomics.com. Thanks for listening.